get back to seeing this thing. All right, so slightly more on topic. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the uh, neurobiology of aggression in children. Right? We've we've spent some time this semester talking about aggression and in, in, in other things. Right? Uh, crustaceans. We talked about rodents. We talked about mothers. Uh, we talked about men. Right? We talked about uh, you know all the different hormones, testosterone. We talked about estrogens. We talked about uh, the effects of, of lactation. We talked about sensory aspects of this. We covered even optical urine, which was a lot of fun. But we haven't really, really focused on, on children, right? And thinking about why, why would children be aggressive? Because if you start to think about those reasons that we listed, right, for aggression, okay, and we said what are the some of the top reasons? that a species or an animal or a person or a whatever is aggressive and, and Aspen, we, we, we said mates. Probably doesn't really apply to children. We said uh, food, food, right, or resources also probably doesn't really apply to children a whole lot, even, even in societies that are, that are what we would consider more traditional, right? Uh, you know, if you were to go back in our species a few millennia, Young offspring are not responsible in most species for acquiring their own food, especially in mammals, right? If you think about mammals, they're getting that food from their uh, mothers. There is some sort of uh, competition between siblings, perhaps. Uh, so we talked about that. Territorial defense. Again, kids, you know, young offspring aren't really responsible for territorial defense, right? They're, they're kind of useless at that, right? I don't know if you're, you know, you're like trying to defend your territory. You don't send a bunch of three-year-olds out there. Typically, right? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, so it doesn't seem like that would be, you know, it, it just seems like a lot of the, the obvious things that we've talked about, they don't really match, right? They don't really match with kids. And so maybe why, why would kids be aggressive? There are a number of things to consider about kids uh, and, and why they, they might be aggressive, right? Why they might, uh, they might have some problems. And so there, there are a couple models, right, when we're talking about childhood aggression. One of those is what we call frontal lobe dysfunction, right? How many of you have a frontal lobe? All right, hopefully most of you. Those of you that quickly raised your hands, it may not be working as well as it should have because you don't have as much impulse control, right? Uh, one of the big things your frontal lobe does is uh, it, it really uh, helps you with higher order planning, right? Really helps you analyze situations. It really helps you sort of look at the social environment and figure out what your next steps are, right? And I think you're all probably familiar with this guy, right? Phineas Gage. Uh, he had a, a head that kind of looked like this. Looks like a Kool-Aid man or something there. Is Kool-Aid still a thing? Okay, thank you. That's all I needed to know. Because, I, I mean, once I hit that third decade of my life, I kind of stopped drinking Kool-Aid. Uh, I, I also stopped drinking things mixed with Kool-Aid because I realized, like, I'm an adult. You know, I, I, I don't have to, like, mix in the fruit punch flavor with whatever it is. You know, I'm, I'm trying to drink. If I just want to drink whatever, I, you know, a glass of water, I take a glass of water, right? So you have this guy Phineas Gage, and he worked on it for a railroad company. This is exactly what he looked like. I saw a picture of him. Uh, he worked for a railroad company back in the 1800s. Uh, you know, if you think about, you guys drive down the interstates, right, or or any road, and you look at a hillside, and you see it kind of has looks like the hillside's been blown off, right, and it's got these like holes that are drilled down. And that's exactly what they did. They drilled a bunch of holes, crammed in some explosive, kaboom, it's gone, right? Clean it up. Uh, when Phineas Gage was doing this, you had to do that by hand, right? And so you had to take the explosive charge and you had to cram it down in a hole uh, with a thing called a tamping rod, right? I know, right? Which is essentially like a four foot long metal spike, okay? So there he was, 
cramming this explosive down in a hole. And I don't know if you've ever like, you know, hammered around on explosives, not the safest thing to do. Occasionally the blasting cap will go off, and that's exactly what happened to, to Mr. Gage here. And it he literally shot a rocket through his head, right? It went up through the bottom, it came out the top, and it it landed like 30 feet away from him. Yeah, I mean, and we're we're not talking about, you know, like a thread. We're talking about something that was a couple inch diameter. I mean, this really was a serious thing that he shot through his head, right? Totally blasted out what's called his ventral medial uh, prefrontal cortex, right? VMPFC. Okay. The job of the VMPFC really is to help you analyze social situations, complex situations with other folks, and make decisions about how you should act in that situation, right? And so if you think about this, you're in a complex social situation right now, right? You're sitting here in class. There are certain, there, there are certain rules in this class, right? Certain things that are acceptable for you to do and certain things that are not. When you're in another group setting, if you're in a different building, maybe even one on this same street that's like a block away, like the Cam Henderson Center, there's a different set of rules, right? A different set of behaviors are acceptable, right? In, in that building, you can stand up and you can yell and you can do the wave and, you know, whatever it is you want to do, right? And you, I'm, I'm, I've seen you all do that uh, to much embarrassment, but um, I, I don't know. Uh, but in here, that would be really odd if you just stood up and started, like, applauding randomly or, you know, yelled, good shot, or, 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 or if you tried to start the wave, right? I, I, I mean... Yeah, I, I, I just don't, it's, it's not accepted, right? It's weird. And so what Phineas Gage would do is he would, after he had his head injury, surprisingly he lived, um, he would find himself in, in social situations, and what he would do in those situations is, is not behave properly, right? He might come to class and stand up and try to do the wave, or he might do other things. He actually had a, a, a real personality change, right? He was uh, sort of previously described as just like a regular guy. People liked hanging around him. You know, he was kind of a nice guy. Afterward, uh you know, people might not like to hang around him. They might, um, you know, he might be kind of grouchy inappropriately, right? Might be some problems. So your, your VMPFC is very important for how you assess a situation, right? And if you're thinking about whether or not you should behave aggressively in a situation, you really need to assess that situation, right? So uh, we can think about a situation. What happens if somebody runs at you like this? Is that a situation where you need to be aggressive or not? Well, you don't know, right? Because there's a lot of context there that's missing. If the guy running at you like this is somebody on your sports team uh, because you just hit like a game-winning shot, then you don't have to be aggressive. If a guy's running at you like this uh, and he just, you know, jumped out from behind a bush and is yelling, give me all your money, then maybe you need to, to have some aggressive response, right? So analyzing these complex social situations, right? is difficult. We have brain regions dedicated to this, okay? Because we find ourselves in complex social situations where context matters, right? And if you don't believe me, probably one of the most complicated things to do uh, in terms of a social situation is analyze someone's uh, speech and, and uh, particularly related to sarcasm, right? If you think about a statement that somebody makes, oh, that's great, right? If somebody says, oh, that's great, that could, depending on the context, depending on the tone, that can really make a big difference in how you reply, right? Oh, that's great. And, oh, that's great. Uh, those are two completely different things, right? And you have to analyze that uh, at some deep level. If you have problems with your prefrontal cortex, you're not going to be able to do that, okay? Uh, and, in fact, frontal lobe dysfunction is the idea that your, um, your, your frontal lobe is, is just, it's not doing its job, right? It's, it's not... It's not properly. Um, it's not properly analyzing situations or giving you the information that you need, right? And so, because of that, you you as a child, in particular, might act aggressive, right? The problem with this is is um, you know how do you know if this is different from something like uh, like ADHD or some other problem, right? How do you how do you define that separately? And that, that seems to be a real challenge in the field, that they're not quite able to, to adequately tease apart those two, right? What's aggressive behavior and what's just hyperactive behavior? Because they're two completely different things, right? Um, you might knock a bunch of people down, 
but that could be because you're angry, you're aggressive, and you're just trying to push people down and take their toys. You might also knock a bunch of people down because you're just running in circles all day, right? And and so those might be might be different things going on, right? And so that that, that sort of becomes a problem. Um, is it like you're talking about not being able to understand sarcasm and being like just like randomly aggressive? Is that like something that plays into autism? Is there that stuff that they have a hard like a hard time? Trying? Yeah. So. That's actually a great question. Um, boy, if, if, if Aspen, only someone on this campus were interested in looking at aggression and autism and how they're treating that with uh, dietary supplements, right? It would be a really interesting thing to do. I say that because I, I have an animal protocol in that's being reviewed about this. Um, so so uh, we could step back a half step, right? One, if you ask me... I, I think we don't have a very clear idea of what autism spectrum disorder is, um, and I think a lot of people are are in that category who who have a variety of problems that may or may not all be the same problem, right? The the sort of underlying statement is these are individuals who have difficulty interpreting social situations, right? And that that's kind of the the, the overarching. Uh, symptom, right? Where, wherever you, you fall on that, that spectrum, however you, you kind of want to define autism spectrum disorder, it has to include some, some inability to appropriately analyze a social situation, right? And so definitely, if you're not able to analyze a social situation, if you're not able to, to appropriately think about the consequences of your actions and how that relates to someone else, how that might make that other person feel, then you are more likely to be aggressive. And in, in fact, you know, one of the um, one of the difficulties um, is is aggressive behavior in in individuals with autism spectrum disorder. Right? Some of the other behaviors don't create as many uh, social problems for them. Right? Uh, I, I had a neighbor. He lived with his parents. Um, he was, you know, an adult. He, um, he had autism spectrum disorder. He was a little aggressive occasionally. He'd, he'd lost a few jobs because of that. Uh, he had some other symptoms, right? He had some stereotyped behavior. He would rock back and forth when you when he talked to you. He would talk to you for a while, and he'd say, okay, I think you're done talking to me, and he'd just walk away. Uh, and so, so Jim was a great guy. I, I, I liked Jim quite a bit. He would just walk the neighborhood. It was great, though, because like when I would forget to like shut my garage door, Jim would shut my garage door for me, which was nice. And then he'd come tell me about it, and then he would realize I was done talking to him, and he would tell me, and he would leave. Uh, he would also dig through your trash. He had uh, in his garage, it was all full of electronics equipment, and so he would make like solar powered Christmas slides. He took a, you know, those things they have at the, at the gas stations to cook hot dogs? He took one of those once, I don't know what he did to it, and he stuck it in the ground so it passed a current through the dirt, and he would uh, like shock worms until they came up to the surface, and he'd collect worms and try to sell them to people uh, to go fishing. I mean, it, was, I mean, it was kind of an interesting project. Uh, but you know some of the other things that he did were not necessarily problematic, but the aggressive behaviors would sometimes cause him some some difficulties, right? Um, have, having some of the other social interaction issues are not not maybe as troubling, but yeah, definitely the aggressive behaviors are, are something that's related there. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, one of the other models is something called fear dysfunction. Uh, there's a bullet point under there that says vague. Uh, the reason that's there is because it's sort of vague the way they try to describe what is fear dysfunction, right? And the, the basic end result is kids aren't properly processing information related to things that they should be afraid of and, and fears. The, the real problem with this, Miriam, is that it all folds really back into frontal lobe dysfunction. If you ask me, right? Because your frontal lobe is, is important. There's an important circuit between your uh, uh, VMPFC and a brain region called the amygdala. What's interesting about these two brain regions is, is they, they kind of they work in opposite directions on things, right? Your amygdala is your fear nucleus. When your amygdala is activated, you're going to respond to something um, as, as though it's a threat, right? So if we want to step back and we want to think about individuals with PTSD, 
Okay. Uh, what is one of the what are some of the hallmark symptoms of PTSD? It really all boils down to an exaggerated response to a stimulus, right? You see individuals who have PTSD, they may uh, flinch or they may duck under uh, cover if they if they hear a, a, a noise that for most people it would go like oh you know somebody dropped a pencil uh, you know they, they have more exaggerated responses to things than you would anticipate the reason for that is their amygdalas are overactive right now there are a number of ways your amygdala can become overactive um, and, and you know we can think about those but your amygdala is overactive in in a situation like PTSD. Now, how does that relate to kids? Well, kids have a, an amygdala, and that amygdala is, is, is working and it's doing things. Um, the amygdala is sort of, it, it's sort of controlled, it's regulated by that ventromedial prefrontal cortex, right? That VMPFC is the guy who's doing uh, impulse control, okay? The one who's telling the amygdala like, hey, slow down. This is probably not a life or death situation. Okay, this is probably a situation where you can relax and analyze what's going on. Take your time. You don't have to lash out at this, right? Let's not have a fear response. In kids, though, their VMPFC is not not fully developed, and it doesn't really develop until you reach like adolescence, maybe even early adulthood, right? Uh, other things the VMPFC does is it, it again allows you to do those social situations. It allows you to put yourself in someone else's shoes, right? It allows you to think about what someone else is feeling and what someone else is doing and how your actions can negatively impact them, right? Kids don't typically have that capability, right? They don't get that capability until quite a bit later. Uh, a lot of times we think about teaching kids these things, right? Like, oh, we got to teach kids. Uh, and, and yeah, there's there's definitely some learning element involved in that, but there's some developmental aspect as well, right? Without a properly functioning VMPFC, it do, doesn't really matter how much you try to teach kids uh, to behave or to, 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 to not be aggressive or, or whatever. If their VMPFC is not really ready to process that information, they're, they're not, it's not going to work, right? So there you go. Uh, so again, if your amygdala is, is overactive or more active than your VMPFC, you're going to get a situation where you're going to respond, you know, like there's a fear situation, right? And you're going to respond more aggressively. This is why you'll see kids throw a fit when they don't get a toy, right, at the store. Uh, is that really going to kill them? No, but they probably think so, right? Because the VMPFC is not there saying, hey, we're so sorry you didn't get a transformer today, but you're going to be fine. Right? Their amygdala is saying, I didn't get a transformer. I'm going to die because of that. Right? Makes sense, right, Manny? I'm not going to ask you because you don't have to answer this uh, if you've been in a life or death situation before. Right? But if you can think about a life or death situation, right, how are you going to respond in that situation as, as aggressively and as violently as possible, right, or as necessary? And that's what kids are doing, right? It's like, oh, I want an Optimus Prime. And so they're just going to you know, kick and scream about it or whatever, uh, because they think if they don't get that, their survival is in danger, right? And so when you start to think about it that way, it makes a lot of sense, right? It's like, oh. Yeah, there's some element to that too, right? There's some learning there, like, this was an effective strategy before, I'll do that strategy again. And that's particular, particularly effective with aggressive behaviors, because we see this in other species. When there has been an, uh, an animal, we talk about like hierarchies, right, in a colony, and we think about like, you know, that, that top animal, right, that alpha animal. How did it get to the top? It got there by being aggressive, right? And so when they're aggressive and they're successfully aggressive, like in a fight, they're more likely to try to fight again because, again, that's been a, su a successful strategy. And kids are just doing the same thing, right? The last time I, I caused a fight, I got an Optimus Prime. I bet if I do it this time, I'll get a star screen. You know, it's just going to happen. Um, it's just the way it works. So there you go. So that's why, you know, if your kids start screaming, what do you do with them? Um, you just leave them there. They'll get tired, right? The reason kids are smaller than you is so you can pick them up and carry them to your car. And don't worry about being embarrassed like everybody's kids have screamed. And you've probably done it too to your parents, right? You've probably pitched a fit somewhere. and Yeah, right, Emily? Probably did it last week.
No. Your mom didn't buy you an Optimus Prime and you got upset. Well, it works so I can buy my own Optimus Prime. But. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, enjoy that. <laughs> so there you go. That's kids and their their crazy frontal lobes, right? That don't they don't work. They don't really come on until later. Your VMPFC does some interesting things. Um, how many of you've heard of the trolley problem? Maybe we should talk about the trolley problem in a moment. Right, so this is when you get to push people in front of a trolley, uh, which sounds like a lot of fun, right? So the idea with the trolley problem is we've set up a situation where um, you there's a trolley. There are like five people on the tracks tied down, and there's one person on this other track and you got to pull a lever and you've got to decide where the trolley goes, right? Is it going to run over five people or is it going to run over one person? We're going to assume all of these people are equally good, right? And none of them are related to you. Uh, the easy answer here is pull the lever so one person dies, right? You do the math. Is it better to kill five people or kill one person? I mean, killing one person is the better option here because we're making you do this. There's no way out of it. We're not letting you stop the trolley in any other way. Right? It's got to go down one of these paths. You're going to kill one or you're going to kill five. Okay? Makes sense. Uh, the, there are variations on the trolley problem. One of the sort of common variations is, all right, fine. Uh, you just had to pull a lever. It's not very personal, right? Now we're going to put you on a bridge with like another person. And we're going to put five people back on that trolley track. The only way to stop the trolley now is to push the other guy off the bridge. You don't have the body mass to stop the trolley, so you can't jump off on your own, right? There's no other way to stop the trolley but pushing this guy off the bridge into the way of the trolley, right? Uh, so you have the option of not pushing a guy off the bridge, which is going to kill five people, or you have to actually personally push someone off a bridge, and they'll die, uh, but you'll save five people. What's interesting about these two problems is the answer is still the same. You definitely just push that guy off the bridge, right? Because again, it's, it's, it's better to kill one person than five, right? I mean, that, that seems to make sense, right? Uh, the difference is, though, one of those is less personal than the other, right? One of those is a little more complicated. That second situation where you actually have to push that person off the bridge and you get to see them like flailing and screaming as they're falling down uh, onto the tracks, right? Is, is a bit more difficult for you to, to feel comfortable doing that. Uh, interestingly, your VMPFC is much more active while you're thinking about that second uh, situation with the trolley problem. So it gets a bit more involved in some of those what we call moral judgments, right? Uh, things where you have to decide, like, should I, should I do this or not? Uh, and the more complicated and more personal that situation is, the more involved uh, that, that prefrontal cortex area gets. It's kind of cool, right? So there you go. If you asked Phineas Gage, he'd probably sing I'm a little teapot and knock the guy over. I, I mean, I say I'm a little teapot, it's a random thing. Who knows why, you know, he just did it. His frontal cortex is gone. So that's exciting, right? Aren't you glad you came to class? Alligator penises and pushing people off bridges. <laughs> Other questions about this? It's kind of straightforward, right? Kids' brains aren't fully developed. When they're not fully developed, they're going to improperly analyze situations. And they're going to choose behaviors that don't work. Now, you might think, wouldn't it be better? Wouldn't it be better if they were, like, relaxed first, and then later the amygdala got geared up? Like, let's give them that VMPFC first so they can analyze situations and make kids much more tolerable, right? But it also decreased the likelihood that they would live, okay? Because you need that amygdala at the very beginning. You need that, right? Because we said, one, which is more likely to lead to injury, offensive or defensive aggression? It's defensive. So you don't want to wait. You want to be the aggressor, right? And very early on, you're very vulnerable, right? And the more vulnerable you are, the more likely you want to be the aggressor. Right? If, if you're rather formidable, right, you don't have to throw those first punches. Okay? Uh, if you're Muhammad Ali, you, you, you really don't ever have to throw a punch, right? You just dance around until the other guy passes out. 
right? And it's an effective strategy. So he was very formidable. He was very, very good at what he did. Um, I think someone called him the greatest once. I think it was probably him, and then a bunch of other people did afterward. <laughs> I think it was an apt title. Uh, so if you're if you're if you're very you know physically formidable, if you have some other what's that f fancy word we used resource holding power, right? If you have high resource holding power, then you can you can afford to be a bit more patient, a bit more cautious. You can wait, right? Wait until somebody attacks you, and then you can you can defend that, right? If you're a kid, what's your resource holding power? It's zero, right? I mean, I mean, I mean, what can I? They literally have a saying for this, and it's taking candy from a baby, right? That's as easy as taking candy from a baby. So that tells you the resource holding power of a baby. It's zero, right? However you want to compare that, it's zero. They have no resource holding power. So because they have no resource holding power, they need to be the aggressor, right? Because they can't afford to be on defense, right? If they wait, they're going to lose. Now, are they probably going to lose even if they're the aggressor? Well, maybe. But sometimes they walk away with an Optimus Prime. So there you go. Does that make sense to everybody? It's kind of nice the way it all weaves in there together, right? It's cool like that, right? The way your brain works, like it does. That's what's amazing, right? I don't think people realize like how amazing we are at certain things because we're so amazingly good at them that it's so easy, right? Like like recognizing faces. That that is a very 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 complicated task, and we are phenomenal at it, right? You just go, yep, I know that person. Here's their name. Here's what I did with them last week, and why I don't like them. Uh, it, yeah, and analyzing. We're actually really good at analyzing social situations, um, and we don't recognize we're not good at it, or or that 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 we have these dedicated brain regions for it, and you know we use so much brain power for it until we run across a guy like Phineas Gage who's had some damage and lost that capability. Or we think about kids or other people who've had frontal lobe damage and they, we see that increased um, aggressive behavior. So there you go. It's pretty exciting, right? We should probably think about types of aggression. And we've talked about types of aggression in a lot of ways, right? I mean, I mean Alexis, that's, that's, that's been a thing we've done, right? We've said there's this kind and that kind, all this kind of other things. Uh, but particularly relating to, to, to kids and adolescents, we want to think about two kinds. We want to think about what's called reactive and what's called instrumental, right? And these are, these are two very different sort of um, situations. Right. So if we think about reactive aggression, we're thinking about something that's, that's um, possibly heightened because of prior threats. Okay. Right. Prior, prior th threats are going to cause uh, an overactive amygdala. So let's go back and think about that person who has PTSD. Right. How do you develop PTSD? Anybody have an idea? It's called post, and then the T stands for, trauma. yeah, right? So, so right there, you had to have some sort of traumatic event, okay? That would be a threat of some sort, right? And in fact, you're more likely to develop PTSD um, in response to personal attacks than you are like uh, natural disasters, right? So if you're mugged on the street, you're more likely to get PTSD than if your house is destroyed by a tornado and you're inside of it. When somebody tells me a scary story, somebody tells me like a story that something that happened to him or her. And then you get PTSD from that? I think that's fairly unlikely. I took a normal last semester and apparently there's like a whole category of, in the DSM now for PTSD um, from people who heard about a trauma that happened to a loved one. And I don't know if I bank with that, but it's in the DSM. So it's apparently yeah, there have been other things in the DSM, right, that they got rid of as they got smarter. Is that the word I'm going to use? I guess I'm not really curious about that. Are there, like, certain 
Yeah, yeah. Because I know, like, you got, like, the really, like, traumatic, like, is there other possible, like, smaller scale levels of that? So, I, I think once you've crossed the threshold to have PTSD and to get a diagnosis with PTSD, you're, you're, you're up there, right? I mean, not, not, don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean there aren't people who don't have other issues. And typically, when we talk about PTSD, we would talk about other sort of anxiety issues as well, right? Because it is sort of an outgrowth of of anxiety um, as, as a result of, of those traumatic events, right? But there are folks who have uh, different, there are different types of symptoms you get with PTSD and you can have uh, different, you know, sort of severity levels with that. Uh, one of the biggest predictors of developing PTSD are sort of two things that are, that'll, um, uh, you know, that, that are important here. One is um, sex. Females are, are uh, more likely to develop PTSD than males. I know, typically you think, I, I mean, sort of the mm, media image of someone with PTSD is a, is a returning soldier, right? Which is definitely something that needs addressed and needs attention, and, and we shouldn't bypass that. But in fact, women are much more likely to develop PTSD than men. Um, and the second thing that, that'll um, increase the likelihood that you develop PTSD is what we call ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. Right. So if you were the uh, victim of child abuse, uh, if you had uh, other traumatic things that happened to you during your, your early years, you're going to be more likely to have, um, you know, you, you're, you're going to, you still have to have that traumatic event, right? But you're going to be more likely for that traumatic event to actually develop, uh, cause you to develop PTSD. So would you say that? People who have PTSD that don't they do have a so obviously there are people who have PTSD that don't right and so if you don't have a fully developed frontal lobe you might be more likely to develop PTSD right uh, but I would not say that that's that's a, um, a hallmark characteristic in in fact what what you know you can have all you really need is a difference between frontal lobe activity and amygdala activity, right? And in folks with PTSD, we typically think about their amygdala being more active, not their frontal lobe being less active. Does that make sense? Um, and so what you do have is you do have that, that overactive amygdala, right? You definitely have that amygdala that's really keyed up, right? And it's really ready. And in fact, it's, it's even down to the cellular level, right? You can get down to one cell in your amygdala and you can measure its activity. And you can see in folks who have PTSD, or in animal models of PTSD, that those cells are more likely to, to actually become activated and fire action potentials um, in these models, right, in the amygdala. So that, that, that's a very clear thing. If you block activity in the amygdala, uh, you can actually um, reduce the development uh, and the symptoms of PTSD. One of the things that you can do is uh, use what's called an NMDA uh, antagonist, right? There are some problems with that. NMDA is required for learning and memory. Uh, obviously, if you've forgotten that traumatic event, you don't have PTSD anymore, right? So, so there's that. Uh, this is so. How many of you love ketamine? Don't answer that. Uh, <laughs> seeing who's got impulse control problems. Uh, how many of you are familiar with ketamine uh, on an academic level? <laughs> now some hands because, up. Again, I was wondering because you were like, you ended there and I was like. Yeah, on an academic level, right? Uh, so ketamine is what we call a dissociative anesthetic, uh, right? They'll use ketamine. There are really only two, two places today that people use ketamine. Uh, one's in their uh, cats and horses. It's a veterinary anesthetic. The reason they'll use it as a veterinary anesthetic is there's not a need for you to intubate, right? And so you can, uh, you don't have to have a ventilator going or uh, anything like that. So you can give them this anesthetic, knock them down for a bit, you know, scoop out their ovaries or whatever it is you're doing to your cat, sew them back up and send them down the road, right? So, uh, so, so it is a veterinary anesthetic. The other sort of, I mean, there, there's kind of a third use now, but the other sort of use is actually they use it as a battlefield anesthetic, right? And so it's, it's nice in that regard in the sense that as a medic, you could give someone just a shot of ketamine. The nice thing about ketamine is it doesn't produce, it doesn't make you unconscious, right? It just sort of disconnects you from reality. So if you give someone ketamine, you can, they can still get up and they can like 
walk around, right? And they can still do things. They don't really know what they're doing. They're not going to remember what they're doing because the, the molecules necessary for, for memory are being blocked, right? Which is also helpful if you were in a traumatic event and we give you ketamine uh, at about the same time you're trying to, you know, consolidate that memory, you're not going to be doing that, right? So, so you kind of have that, so it's kind of nice. Uh, they have recently started giving folks ketamine to treat depression, right? Um, which has been successful. I say that with like some caution. I'm, I'm not typically one to advocate uh, like taking a drug that's going to interfere with your ability to remember things to, to treat an issue. Um, I, I think what works there is again you're, you're um, sort of blocking some of those processes but we'll see what the side effects are when it happens. But I think there are some. It's, it, it's a limited it's not like you're going to take an SSRI and you just you can take it for years and you're fine. I don't think you're going to be shooting up ketamine for years and be fine. Uh, ketamine is also often used as a date rape drug, right? So it's kind of like my, like, let me give you your, you know, social safety lecture, right? Uh, so, so go out there and, you know, watch your drinks, right? Don't let people put stuff in there. Uh, the, the, like, double-edged sword about ketamine is you don't have to carry the person out of the bar because they can still walk, uh, right? But the, uh, the second problem is you're not going to remember what happened. So if you try to talk to the police about it, you're out of luck, right? Because you're not going to be able to provide any details because you're, you're literally not encoding those memories. So something happened to you, stuff happened, the person who did it knows what happened, but, but you probably don't. And, you know, when it comes down to the story and you're like, well, I was at a bar and I was at my house and the other guy's like yeah she had too much to drink so I took her home and I put her in bed and then I went home and you know played my Xbox all night uh, that seems like a very confident story he knows what he's talking about right and the other person doesn't have any details to provide so uh, that's my warning to you to be careful out there the concept of repression like, could, you, could you like repress that like whatever, whatever maybe that reason may be, could you be a possible like repress that memory, which kind of in a way is contributed to PTSD, but like that still leads to like other psychological issues that are all like you know, like repress that memory, but still. I wouldn't give that a try. I, I, that's my. That's I mean. I mean. Oh, no, I mean because like sometimes, sometimes people do that like in yeah, I, I, I mean, yeah, I, so, yeah, I'm trying to think about how I want to answer that. Go see Dr. Chapman question. Yeah, why not? I don't send too many people to irritate him. Um, I, I think you're still going to have some problems. I, hold on, because we got something else to talk about that I think will hopefully give you some ideas. Uh, so anyway, that that's. Reactive, right? So we've been talking about reactive. Uh, you're going to be more aggressive. You're, you're just going to have these prior threats that prime you, that build you up, put you in a situation where you're going to be, I definitely want to lash out and I definitely want to attack, right? And that's been, again, a successful model for you in the past. So you're going to do that. There's a second sort of type of aggression called instrumental. Instrumental aggression is, is different in, in that there's some goal involved, right? There's some uh, some endpoint, right? You you you, um, you see someone and they have something you want, and you decide to take it from them, right? 
that aggression is instrumental in the sense that, that it's goal directed. You're not just having a, a spontaneous reaction to that, right? You're not just sort of lashing out at something that's not real, right? Or reacting to something like you would in a, in a reactive situation, okay? So you have this instrumental uh, aggression. Sometimes we refer to something called adolescent limited antisocial behavior. That's a mouthful for saying you caused a little trouble when you were a kid, right? And there are some people that, that argue that this, this limited, limited is the key word, right? Antisocial behavior is, is kind of the hallmark of being an adolescent, right? Uh, how many of you, again, you don't have to answer this question. Um, let's think about this. How many of you, and, and you may even do this now, but how many of you as an adolescent uh, violated a rule? Yeah, right. I know it's 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 so common. It's a ridiculous question to ask, right? And again, it's it's probably because that is sort of a hallmark characteristic of being an adolescent, right? Because you're transitioning from childhood to adulthood, and you're trying to find the boundaries of those rules, and so you will you will push, right, up to the edge of those rules, and you'll find where that boundary is. Sometimes you go over, right, uh, but you got to go over to know where the edge is, right, to know where the limit on that rule is. So is this different than like conduct disorders? Like this is yes. just, just you being a kid, not you being like absolutely. a sociopath. No, no. We use the word antisocial in there, not in any sort of diagnostic sense, but in the sense that it's you're not following the social norms. You're not following the rules, right? You, you were a kid and you, you spray painted a road sign. Uh, you you know you kicked over somebody's mailbox. Um, I'm not saying these aren't things that aren't um, worthy of punishment because they clearly are, and you need to have that punishment so you know where the line is. But at the same time, I, I mean, you egg somebody's house once. I, I I mean, is that is that a real problem, or is that just a like regular thing? Now there are clearly lines, right? Uh, where that's like, nah, that's a real problem, okay? Uh, and there are certain behaviors that are definitely, uh, you know, over the line, right? But I, I, I think there are a number of behaviors that are sort of within this situation that are antisocial. But again, the key word is limited, right? Uh, let's say you, uh, I don't know, you went out and you did a bunch of donuts in your high school parking lot, right? I mean, that's, that's a rather innocuous thing to do, right? Anybody do that? Yeah, right. But hopefully, you know, when he's 35, he's not going to do it, right? He doesn't do it anymore, right? He's done. It's limited, right? It was a limited thing, okay? Uh, why did he do it? Well, he thought it was cool, and he was pushing the limit to know where the line was, right? So I think that's perfectly reasonable. If you've been doing donuts in your high school parking lot for 10 years, a couple problems there, Manny. But, uh, you, you know, when you don't outgrow these, these sort of antisocial behaviors, that's when we really want to think about problems. Or when those behaviors um, clearly cross over a line, right? Uh, and, and I think it's, um, it's sometimes difficult to say where that exact line is, but I think you would all sort of know where that was if you saw it, right? Does that make sense? There's, there's usually some um, error in cost calculation here, right? Uh, your brother probably didn't think about what the cost was on that, right? It's like, this is cool. I'm getting a real benefit. Everybody in high school thinks I'm the coolest person because I can do donuts. Um, and then maybe he didn't think about the cost of, you know, could he lose control of his vehicle? Could he cause damage to another person? I'm not saying these things happen. But they could have, and he didn't. He didn't calculate those costs. That's why we have the rule: no donuts in the parking lot, right? Because there are costs to that, and you have to calculate those costs. And most adolescents are not really great at calculating costs. And the reason they're not good at calculating costs is their VMPFC is not fully online yet, right? Even in adolescence, um, it doesn't really come online until you're you're a bit into adulthood. So you're really trying to to calculate that. Uh, you know, you're, you're not really doing a good job calculating that cost. Your amygdala is involved here as well, uh, but it's actually going in the other direction. It's not as active uh, for instrumental. Now, that doesn't mean it's always not active. It just means in that particular situation, uh, Caleb, it's going to drop down a little bit, right? Because, again, you're not afraid of the, the possible 
outcomes, right? You're not worried about getting in trouble with whatever you're doing, so your amygdala is kind of kind of not as active in that particular situation, right? So it's, it's going the other way. It's not hyperactive, making you aggressive because you're afraid someone's going to attack you or hurt you or take your resources. It's less active uh, and because you're not worried about the consequences, right? You're not thinking about those consequences or calculating those appropriately. You do want your amygdala to be active. It needs to be appropriately active and balanced with that prefrontal cortex, right? So you get those uh, that appropriate set of outcomes. So that's kind of cool, right? Yeah. The other problem is um, with, or the other issue to think about here with the instrumental, uh, and, and I think this is something you should think about related to your questions. So, is uh, something called extinction, right? And so, with extinction, and Miriam, this is a different kind of extinction than what you're familiar with from, from your Tuesday night adventures. Um, when, we, when we learn something, right, we're, we're making a very physical connection between cells in our brain. Uh, when one gets active, another one gets active, and, and you, you, know, you learn that connection, you make that connection. It's a very complicated string of events biochemically we could talk about, again, involving what we call NMDA, which was related to that whole ketamine story I told you about. Uh, but we also have um, we, we have to have situations where we realize that those connections are no longer valid, right? Our environment changes from time to time, right? Uh, and even if you live in the same place, your environment changes. You think about the seasons, right? You see the seasons change, you know, from month to month. Uh, the weather's different. The climate patterns are, you know, things change. So one of the things that uh, that's kind of a good example of extinction, we're coming up on the time of year when you guys are going to start wearing coats, right? You're going to start wearing fuzzy hats and wool socks and I don't know thermal underwear, whatever it is, you guys. I, I don't you know, you guys don't wear thermal underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds weird. How many of you have ever worn thermal underwear? I, I, there you go, right? It's a thing. Trust me. They sell them at the store. Oh, you mean like long johns? Yes. I thought you meant like panties, but like wool. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so is it less weird now? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I thought every, I mean, now how many of you have worn thermal underwear? Does that increase the number? Okay. All right. Uh, one of the problems in the winter is uh, static electricity, right? Okay. So you're wearing all those uh, fuzzy kind of things. You're moving around. The air's a bit drier. You touch a doorknob and you get shocked, right? First few times you do that, you're, you're, you're not ready for it, right? Kapow! It gets you. Try to leave. Kapow! It gets you, right? You're leaving your home. Uh, but after a little while, because this happens in my office, right? My chair, I think when I roll around, my chair picks up static electricity, and then I go over to my doorknob, and I'm, you know, I kind of hesitate a little bit, because I know it's going to shock me, so I'm ready for it. Uh, but that only lasts for a few months, right? And then uh, the season changes, and I can reach it for my doorknob, and everything's fine, right? And so then I, I realize that connection's not valid anymore. The doorknob's not going to shock me. I can just reach out and there's no hesitation, right? So you're changing the weight of that particular uh, connection. And that's what we call extinction. Okay? Extinction is not uh, forgetting something. It's simply, simply the process of taking a connection and recognizing that that connection is no longer as strong as it used to be. Okay? The reason it's not forgetting, and I think this is maybe where we should think about repressed memories and so forth, is is that, and my doorknob is kind of a low-level situ you know, situation, but the situation is that when you are exposed to that stimulus again, it doesn't take long for you to sort of jump back to that high-level connection, right? 
So maybe the first time you're, you're in your house or your home or your, wherever you are that your doorknob shocks you, it takes you several times grabbing the doorknob for you to kind of develop that hesitation, right? But the next time, you know, after it's not shocked you for a while, the next winter when rent rolls around, first time you get shocked, you're ready for it, right? You get shocked and you go, ah, it's time. And so from then on, you know, there's no sort of learning curve later, right? Extinction is not forgetting, it's simply sort of taking that connection offline until you need it again and then bringing it back. So, Was it the, that guy that the guy with the man that Oh, Stanley Milgram? Yeah, or the rats. <clears throat> oh, Garcia's rats. Did we talk about Garcia's rats? Huh? Where, where, oh. I can't tell. Where he was, um, doing extinction, where he's trying to, uh, do the, where he tried to, like, um, train a rat to, like, press the button. I don't know, he was a sustained or something like that. Pandora. Yes. Did he? Yes. Did he use extinction? Then he tried to. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, I'm I'm not entirely sure where you are, but uh, extinction is a pretty common concept in in like learning experiments. Mm -hmm. Dr. Doug, uh, what'd he tell you about extinction? <clears throat> yeah, probably wasn't as good as what I would tell you. Um, but extinction is, is, again, the important thing is it's not forgetting, right? Just because you've extinguished a memory or, or caused that to, 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 to not be at the forefront, that connection's not there, doesn't mean that it's not going to quickly jump up there, right? And, and, and really cause you some problems. This is one of the big reasons that individuals have difficulty um, uh, breaking addictive behaviors, right? Because you've, you've performed some behavior for an extended period of time, right? Whatever that is, and you've been getting a big rush of dopamine, a big bonus out of that, and so that's been awesome. You get to the point where, you, I mean, one of the number one things they tell you to do if you're, you're dealing with, uh, with an addiction is to change your environment, right? They say get in a different environment because you want to get away from all those sensory cues that would trigger that, right? But then the problem is what happens when you go back into that environment, right? It triggers, it brings it back, right? It just brings back that same that same thing. Uh, one of the problems with, with this is often you, you can't get out of the environment or there are things about the environment that, that are common everywhere, right? And so that can really create a, create a big problem for you. Um, and I think that's, so this is my, like, if you or someone you know is dealing with uh, an addiction issue, be fully prepared for relapse because it's going to happen, right? I'm not trying to, like, discourage you, uh, you know, uh, while you're, you're helping someone or helping yourself on this process. It's going to happen, and you should be prepared for that um, <clears throat> because sometimes people are not, and then they die. So that's how that happens. That's why you, you, you see these individuals all the time that, are, that have been clean for a while, and then they go back and they use drugs again. They, they weren't ready for it, so they used that last, well, last time I was doing this, here's how many grams I was using. Uh, not remembering, like, man, I'm, I was on cocaine five years before I got up to that amount. I can't jump right back into that because my, my physiological tolerance mechanisms are no longer there. John, did you have something? Um, oh yeah. Yeah. So that's what he would do. So he, he you can, what you can do with that situation is press a lever, get a reward. Eventually, they press a lever, they get the reward. They know what's going to happen. Don't give them a reward. They'll keep pressing the lever. They'll eventually stop. But then, as soon as you uh, sort of indicate to them they'll get a reward again, they'll jump right back. They won't have to learn that association again because it's already there. Skinner also trained a bunch of pigeons to guide missiles. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. You got questions about pigeons and missiles? Oh, no. Oh, that's okay. You can ask anything then. I was going to ask about that. Those addictions, like, could that be like self-destructive behavior to someone that's 
Like, I feel like how it is very confusing. In what kind of context? Like self-destructive behaviors, like um, kind of, kind of like how when you get used to handling something a certain rate to someone, like with like self-harm. It's like most of because like in most cases, like self-harm becomes like a thing for people because it's like a quick, it's like a quick like solution to like off put whatever you're dealing on the inside. So it's like when you did when you when you're used to dealing with something like that for so long, it's hard to like. Once you actually like do like try to stop, it's harder to do that because you know like you're so used to like getting that quick little fix that it's like it's one of those things that's like hard to actually break once you've like been doing it for so long. Again, that's like a stupid question or something. No. <laughs> no, it's not. I, I I'm not a self harm expert, so I kinda wanna be careful what I say about it. Um but any, anything you're doing that is a solution that's been effective, right? And so I, I think, you know, when you get in a situation where you don't think you have other solutions or you don't have other solutions, you'll, you'll do a variety of things, right, to try to get some relief. And if, if that gives you some relief, even if in the long run that, that's something that has negative consequences, yeah, you'll keep doing it. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to get, like, offensive or anything. No, 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 no. I just, I just uh, again, I, I don't want to sort of say something that's, you know, again, not, um, I don't want to say something too specific to something I don't, I'm not, don't really know a whole lot about. Um, but yeah, definitely any, anything that's, uh, that provides you with some relief, right? Even if, if on the surface, you know, we would look at that and say, well, that's definitely a behavior that's not healthy, right? Uh, that if it's something that internally provides you uh, you know, so, some sort of sort of relief or some sort of situation where you're, particularly if you're getting more dopamine out of that than, than other things you've done or the normal situation that you're in, you know, if you can kind of use that as some sort of, we say like a release mechanism. Uh, and in fact, I mean, if it releases dopamine, then yeah, you'll, you'll keep doing it, uh, which I think can describe a whole lot of behaviors, right, that people do. There are a number of things that people do that are, are sort of... Uh, self-destructive, right, that we don't always think about. I don't know if I told you about uh, when I was in graduate school, I had a biochemistry professor, uh, I, and I don't think he had any um, cartilage in his body except in his ears and nose uh, because he, he ran all the time. And when he that, when he would run, he, he yeah, I, I mean, he just, I, it clearly caused him pain and it damaged all of his joints in his, his lower body. You can see he couldn't even really move his legs, like his hips were almost frozen. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was really, but he would go run every day and he would just kind of, it just, it looked, pain, it looked painful. It's like, ah. And so I think, you know, that, it's, it was destructive behavior. He was getting some, some neurochemical benefit out of that, right? Uh, and to him, that was more important than the, like, you know, loss of ability to bend his knees. And so I think uh, if you're asking me, I would say self-harm behavior would fall into the same category. I, I'm very much uh, the two kinds of people in the world, right? They're what you call lumpers and splitters. This is important. Uh, splitters are people who think everything's different, right? And they'll put everything into a separate category. And then there are lumpers who think like, well, everything's just the same. Right, and those are very extreme ends, right? I tend to be a lumper uh, when it comes to human behavior because I tend to think there are only like two or three things that are really important. Um, and actually, there's probably only one thing that's really important and there are two or three things that help you do that. And everything else can kind of fall under that, right? And sort of the number one hallmark of, of, of being a, a, a live anything is uh, reproducing, right? And so that's that's kind of how you have made it this far as other people have reproduced for you. So that's been awesome, right? Uh, that's how you made it here. So you're going to continue to try to reproduce, and, and you think about what can you do so you can get to that point. So you you, you know you think about well, motivations to get food and resources. Well, that why do you want to eat? Well, that's so you can try to reproduce, right? I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Uh, so I try to put things into you know big broad categories, right, and look for commonalities. And I think any behavior that you're going to repeat as a behavior that's going to cause you to release dopamine, right? And it's going to cause you to release more dopamine than it causes you to feel negative consequences. In particular, 
if that dopamine release is immediate and those negative consequences are down the road some distance, right? And when you're thinking about things that are like self-harm behavior, if you're thinking about uh, sort of addictive behaviors, if you're thinking about ingesting or participating in activities that might be dangerous, those are things that the consequences might not show up for a while. And sometimes it's hard to make that connection, right? So uh, when you're dealing with people, if they do something, you know, how many of you have ever tried to train a dog or another pet, right? And so what you do, you're trying to house train your dog, right? Kaylin, the best way to do this is, you know, take your dog out. If it goes to the bathroom, that's awesome. Next week, give it a treat. No, right? That's not going to work at all, right? Because what's your, what, why'd your dog randomly get a treat next week? Well, it doesn't know, right? Uh, you have to, you have to kind of couple the events, right? And when you're doing something that's, that, you know, physically manipulating your body, when you're ingesting substances that very quickly get to your brain, uh, that, that change is, is, is immediate, right? It happens right then. And that, that becomes a very difficult thing to break. Um, yeah. And then you have to try to extinguish that, right? Yeah. And that can be tricky because you've got to go through that, you know, that extinction protocol is long, it's boring, it's difficult, right? That poor mouse just kept pressing that lever. I mean, it kept pressing the lever. I'm just putting out a lot of effort. I mean, it... yeah, and it just gives up. It's like, oh, geez, that's awful. But then all of a sudden there's a sign that says, hey, free food, press this lever. Wow, right back on it, right? It's going to jump right back I in. Never really forgot. It never forgot. Extinction is not forgetting, not forgetting at all. Uh, that, that connection is still there. It's just been kind of like taken offline and you're not using it anymore. It's not important, right? Mm -hmm. I always like to use the example, how many of you have an older brother? Yeah, does your older brother punch you in the ribs? That's exactly what, Miriam, that's exactly what older brothers do, right? I know this. Uh, as an older brother, I, I, I'm aware of this responsibility. Uh, but, but hopefully at some point your brother stops, right? I, I recognize he may not have at this point, right? Because I don't know how old your older brother is. Um, and sometimes it takes a few years, right? So probably when you see your brother and he's in his punching phase, right, you you flinch a little when he gets close, right? Like, what's he going to do? I'm ready for this. Uh, but then at some point after a few years and he, he's not done that to you, you're, you're kind of relaxed, right? Like, oh, he's not going to punch me now. But then all of a sudden, like, what a fun Thanksgiving dinner. He sits next to you and he just pops you in the ribs. You know, from then on, you don't have to wait. You don't have to learn that, right? The first few times he punched you in the ribs, you probably got some freebies, right? Because you weren't ready for it. But after that, you were like, I learned the association. But then after that extinction period, you're not flinching. Then he punches you. You only, one time. One time's all it takes. And then you're back to full rib protection mode, right? I know. I mean, it's amazing, right? The way this works. So there you go. I don't know. Extinction. That story is like almost verbatim brother and I. Yeah. Like, it's a common story. I know. But it's Did he stop punching you in the ribs for a while and yeah, then Yeah, and then like just randomly started again? Yeah, not the last huh. time I saw him, but like, like the time before that when I went out to visit him in Morgantown, he just like just punched me. And I was like, what was that for? Yeah. Just to keep you on your toes. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, that's his job. He's doing a great job. He's doing good, Alex. He's, he's doing good. You can tell him he gets a stamp of approval. We'll give him bonus points in this class. Okay. He's not enrolled, but that's okay. Does that mean I'll get them? No. I mean, it's his work. So there you go. Right? Extinction. What else do I want to say about that? Or was that it? That's probably it, right? Yeah. Oh, how's it tie into this? Like instrumental, right? Uh, so they have problems with extinction, right? So it, it, if you continue to try to, to, to use this instrumental aggression, right? The type of aggression where you... So let's think about that, that sort of, you know, limited antisocial behavior, right? Where you have, uh, I don't know, let's say you've done some shoplifting, right? 
you know, shoplifting's probably not, I'm not trying to make light of, of criminal activity, right? But I don't think, you know, if a 13 year old, you know, shoplifts, a, you know, a, a, an Xbox game, I, I don't think that necessarily means they're, they're on the road to, you, you know, a life of crime, right? I, mean, I think most people have had some, if I were to ask you, I would assume many of you have committed some petty crime uh, for which you may or may not have received a steep punishment, right? May have been something where the police were like, well, don't do it again. And you didn't do it again because you were so scared the process worked, right? The problem is if, if you're not able to extinguish these things, like let's say you you steal that Xbox game, you're like, man, that was awesome because now I have a free Xbox game. Well, that got you some reward, right? You performed an action, you got a reward. So then you try it again. Okay, and you try it again. Once you've done that two or three times and you keep getting the rewards, you're like, oh, this is a great strategy. Even if you get caught, even if you get in trouble, if you're not able to extinguish that behavior, then you're going to continue to try that behavior again, right? And so even when you get to the point where you're like, okay, so I've, I've, I've served some fine or penalty for this behavior, that was not enough for me to stop this behavior, right? I didn't go through that extinction process. It's like if that mouse continued to press the lever a million times, still no food, keeps pressing the lever, right? Okay. If you have problems with extinction, you'll keep trying to do whatever aggressive behavior that was, whatever aggressive behavior was successful for you so that you can, um, yeah, so that you can uh, get some reward from that, even if, in fact, you're getting a punishment from that. And you might have some difficulty there. So there you go. I think this is this is actually particularly important for like uh, criminal justice reform, right? You don't hear a lot of folks when they talk about criminal justice reform talking about neurobiology, <laughs> right? Talking about like learning uh, mechanisms. Nobody's talking about Skinner boxes and 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 things like that. They're not talking about some of these issues and 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 maybe how we can approach the system in a better way. Uh, you know, we, 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 we certainly need laws. I, you know, I'm not gonna advocate for no laws. Uh, probably not even gonna advocate for no prisons. That, that might be beyond what I would advocate for. Uh, there might be things I would advocate for that we probably shouldn't pe put people in jail for. That's a different situation. Uh, Cause that, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But, um, you know, there are certain individuals that need to be sequestered, right? Uh, because their behavior is, you know, uh, such that it's a detriment to them and others. But um, maybe there's a better way we can approach that. Actually help people. So do you think there's a problem with trying children as adults? Like, since they don't have the developed... Yeah, yeah so... Oh, man, jeez. Emily? <laughs> so the problem is, like, like, what's an adult, right? So like if you're really asking me, right, and I'm like, I'm like, you shouldn't try someone as an adult unless their VMPFC is, is fully developed. Now the problem with that is someone who has a fully developed VMPFC is probably, it's very unlikely that they're going to commit a crime, right? If your VMPFC is fully developed, you're probably, you might commit a crime, it might be in an instrumental situation, right? And it might be a situation where uh, you're committing a crime because other possible outcomes are unacceptable, right? And that's something that can be rectified, right? What if you were um, stealing so you could eat, for example, right? You might have a fully developed VMPFC for that. Is punishing someone for that going to be successful at stopping that behavior? Well, certainly. Is also like helping that person get a job going to be successful at stopping that behavior? Well, most certainly, right? Because again, they have a fully developed VMPFC, right? So you don't have to worry about it. Someone who doesn't have a fully developed VMPFC, like let's say a kid, uh, I, don't, 
don't know. I, I don't know how successful that's going to going to be giving them a serious punishment, right? I don't know how how that's going to help them because again, they're 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 they're. I'm not saying give people a pass. I'm not saying there shouldn't be any punishments. I'm not saying there shouldn't be some actions taken to to, to rectify that behavior. But I don't know if taking a, a 15, 16 year old, 17 year old um, who's committed some sort of heinous crime and, and trying them as an adult is really neurobiologically sound. Does that make sense? But then again, there may be 25 year olds. That, that's where the real problem becomes, right? Like, yeah, like, I mean, like, I feel like there's probably like an age where you would be like, you should have a developed cortex yeah. by now. But if you don't, is it your fault? Probably not, right? I, I, I mean, that, that becomes a real challenge, right? I don't know. Then again, you shouldn't just let people do whatever they want. It's a bad idea, too. I don't know, right, Brooke? I mean, what, what do you do? Punish everybody for everything or just let everybody go? Just have a brain score, right? Give everybody a, a, a VMPFC score. Like, what's the how, how good are you at determining right from wrong? Uh, but then there becomes a problem, like there are some people who probably their VMPFC doesn't really work very well, but yet they know, like, nah, I probably shouldn't do that, right? Not because I'm going to feel bad about it, but because there are a bunch of people who tell me I shouldn't and I'm going to lose out on getting to do things I want to do. But if somebody's in the whatever is really developed, so yeah. they use other people to do bad things, is that almost the same? That sounds like a good you know, idea like to me. Manipulate somebody or something. <laughs> so, I think you, know, you found the loophole. Trouble, so let me talk to this. Yeah, I, I, I still think that. I don't know. That's that weird. Yeah, well, I'm. That's why we have things like conspiracy to convert. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I, I think it is a crime. Yeah, I, I, I mean, yeah, is is that maybe harder to to demonstrate? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is. I mean. You don't get in as much trouble for a conspiracy to commit murder as actually committing a murder. I don't know. I think about that stuff though sometimes. Right? But so, so I don't know. I, I mean, I think yeah, I would be hesitant to try a, a kid as an adult if it was me. I mean, if you're asking me personally, and I think there's some 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 scientific and neurobiological evidence to support that sort of personal feeling, right? Um, those underdeveloped brain regions that don't really come online until early adulthood, right? And so there might even, there. I mean, if you really want to think about this, maybe there should even be like a third category, right? There's like adult, there's kid, and there's like in between, teenager. right? Yeah, I, I mean, and that teenager could even extend until your early 20s. Yeah. Uh, you know, that might be folks who are 16 to 22, right? I, I, I mean, that might be a group of people who in that time frame, they, they they're getting a better developed VMPFC, but it's not fully active, right? It's not not what it's going to be when they're 25 or, or, or so. So I don't know. I mean, I mean things are... But again, at the same time, you, you can't... You know, just because somebody's, you know, 21 and kills somebody doesn't mean that you just go like, oh, well. Y you know. Uh, um, and then there are some people who are, you know, like 17, and they're, they've got a fully developed VMPFC, and they're, they're good to go, right? Uh, I don't know. That's what we should do when we sentence people. We should do do a brain scan. Because <laughs> that's not going to drive up costs for justice. Well, not at all. Because I mean, there's no sentencing, right? It's just like you you draw a line. You go like, here's the spectrum. If your VMPFC is this active, this is how many years you get. If it's this active, you get this many. Saves time. Stick somebody in an fMRI and you're done with it. Show them some snakes and see what happens. Okay. Doesn't seem to bother me. I'm just saying, like, I've had an fMRI done and they're not pleasant. They like stick you, they like, shoot you full of dye, and they like cram you in this little machine, and it makes a bunch of noise, and you're like, yeah. hey, this kind of hurts. I'm out of but here. But I but I also can't imagine like sitting in court for days while a jury's like staring me down and a judge is you know scowling at me trying to figure out how long I'm going to be in prison is all that pleasant either. Yeah, but like they're not like sticking needles in you. And I'd rather have another MRI than prison. Oh, you're still going to prison. It's just for how long? Well, like, this is doing this for us sitting in the courtroom. I'd, I'd rather sit in the courtroom. Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I think that's... 
I don't know. People are weird, right? I feel like you're asking this question of people who hopefully are not going to wind up on that side of the courtroom. So they don't really have any stake in it. But yeah, odds are most of you are not going to not going to be in a criminal proceeding on the on the less desirable end. I mean, some of you might be on the other end, right? You might serve on a jury. Some of you might become, uh, you know, uh, professional witnesses or what they call them, expert witnesses. You know, we actually had some faculty who used to do that. They would be um, expert witnesses in, in court cases and so forth, mm -hmm. right? Some of you might be in that situation. If you, if you ever find yourself in that situation, ask the person who's accused, like, hey, if we were to give you an fMRI, would you prefer that over a trial by jury? For sentencing only. For sentencing only. For sentencing only. I think I'm going to make that into a movie. I just feel like that's a problem with like maybe like coercion and like bodily autonomy and just, just several things that are pretty much guaranteed rights. She's worried about so much. Right. So I am. It doesn't require the jury to have like certain high scores, though. They can even perceive like. Huh. Yeah, you have to Man, be a jury through an FMRI. You're onto it right there, right? Like that's the thing, right? Like they'd have to have at least the jury would have to have at least a. But but see, here's what I would want. Like if I was accused of a crime, I I, I wouldn't really want people on the jury <laughs> that were too high, right? Because I might want them to have lower scores. And so then I would make the argument, well, the, the average score of the juror can't be higher than the baseline we find in, popu in, the, popu in, in the population of my peers, right? And, uh, applications? Yeah. Job applications? Yeah. Just, See, we're on to something. Are smart State issues. Well, it's not smart enough. It's just well, have the capacity. developed, you know, to analyze social situations, right? Know the, know the consequences of their, their actions. Can you already do that with you can tell a lot of, and that's actually a pretty, pretty interesting comment there because you can tell a lot of, about someone maybe based on their previous behavior, right? And again, if it's continued behavior, right? That's one reason, like limited behavior. Yeah, if it's limited, it's not so bad. I, I think the real problem is, uh, so so I think the important point here, and I didn't mean to have a whole lecture about like criminal justice reform, but my, my brain scan idea would at least be consistent. And that way, everybody who falls into a certain category, um, at least in terms of their understanding of their actions, would receive uh, an equal sentence. It wouldn't be based on other characteristics about that individual. That seems fair, right? See how it's more fair now. Still, like you're gonna bump into some, some barriers there. Whatever. It's a good idea. I'm just saying, like, practicality is probably not gonna work out. Robots, yep. Uh, I thought a caste system. So, like, at uh, 21, if you get the score, and then you're assigned a certain position. Okay, now we're in the end. Yeah, yeah that's, good. That's, <laughs> that's probably problematic, but. Okay. He's confident that he's going to be in the top tier. <laughs> he is. That's he's like, I have the most perfect prefrontal cortex you have ever seen. Yeah. But I think that does bring up an interesting question, though. And I think that is a thing we don't take into account. We don't think about someone's brain development often when we think about the, the, the actions they take. We don't think about those things, right? I, I probably would not act, advocate actually for brain scans for sentencing, right? Uh, but at the same time, I, I, I think the more the more and more people know about how your brain actually works, uh, the better we can interact with other folks, the better we can design policies and programs that fit, right? And so when you start to think about, um, you know, educational programs, when you start to think about training and after school programs and you started to think about well what can these kids actually handle what 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 the brain development do they have what don't they have then it becomes something kind of interesting right you don't want to try to teach your three-year-old about you know complex social situations right you, you try to teach them other things right you start out smaller because their their vmpfc is not ready to handle some of those, you're not giving a three-year-old a trolley problem. 
right? You're not saying like, hey, you can push someone off a bridge and kill them, or you can not push them off and, and kill five people. What are you going to do? Huh? Yeah, 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 right. I mean, that's a little bit, yeah, start, start with something like that, right? Getting them to think about others. I don't know. Questions about that? It's not so bad, right? Uh, sort of conclusions. Kids are weird, and uh, don't bother trying to understand them. It's going to be a waste of your time. Anybody spend a lot of time with kids? We, we honestly, obviously, know you you have. I'm the big one. But, but these, are, these are true statements, right? Okay. Just put a check mark on both those. Um, Do you make your check marks that way? No. Well, that's wrong. I also. You're the one that put that question on there. <laughs> that's why I put the question on there. Yeah, because you make them wrong. Yeah, I, I this <laughs> that I can't even do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's how I do. See? See, that's the right-handed way to do it. You're going wrong. So, kids are weird. They're in a weird developmental situation, right? Things are coming online, and, and, and not everything is there yet. They've got different motivations. They're dealing with different situations. They're, they're trying to prepare to be an adult, right? And they need to be ready to be aggressive for mating purposes, for resource acquisition purposes, uh, for territorial defense, right? Um, but, uh, but those aren't really things they're dealing with as kids, right? They also need to be ready to kind of fight for their own survival if they're not getting that protection and those resources from their, their parents or other, you know, adults that might be taking care of them. So having that amygdala ready early makes a lot of sense. You can bring other things online later. Right, a screaming kid is annoying, but a kid that never lets you know there's a problem is dead. Right, I, I mean seriously, right? I mean, I mean, if, if all kids never cried, then then how would you ever know they were hungry? So you would go like, well, maybe I should feed it now. I don't know. I'm hungry. I'll feed it. You know, uh, that doesn't that doesn't really make a lot of sense, right? Also, uh, when in, in Signaling your aggressive intentions is, is fairly easy, right? If you think about, if you want to, to, if you want to indicate to someone that you are going to defend your territory, what's an easy thing you can do, right? Shake a fist and, you know, make an angry face. If you need to convey to someone that, uh, you know, that you need a particular kind of resource, that you um, are going to be traveling some distance to somewhere else. Those become much more difficult things to try to communicate, right? I mean, obviously, we can communicate because we have language, but if you think about a uh, sort of a, a species that doesn't have spoken language, that's relying on, you know, body communication, you know, like uh, body language, things like that, um, conveying aggressive actions is easier and it's easier for babies right it's easier for them to kind of act like they're you know convey those aggressive behaviors when they're they're younger they don't even have the language capacities to to, to do some of the other things right uh, can you imagine a baby trying to explain to you you know a complex social situation like why they were you know why, why were you clapping quietly um, in one situation, but, you know, loudly in another, uh, you know, a baby may not be able to, you know, even a three or a five-year-old might not be able to convey that as easily as I'm hungry, feed me now. I don't know. Things to think about. Right? All right. Questions about that? All right. That's sort of where I'd like to stop for the night.